Hey everyone, I'm Coach Shippies and I've been a professional top laner or head coach for the past 8 years. During this time I've reached Worlds and MSI multiple times. Now I'm a full time coach with a ton of passion towards helping players unlock their potential and climb to their dream rank. What's going on guys, in today's video I'm going to be teaching you everything you need to know about how to play the mid game as a top laner. Now I've had a few requests to finally cover this topic and even though it's quite vague, mid game such a large portion of a league game, there are a lot of strategies, methods, whatever you want to call it, that I can teach you that will really help you understand what your role should be in each portion of the game depending on what's happening. So if that sounds good to you, let's get it started. The first topic we're going to be covering is tier 1 towers because depending if these are up or down vastly changes the way you should be playing your mid game. Now let's say in a scenario where you've won your lane and you've broken this tier 1 tower, you can buy so much time to basically impact the map by pushing your wave all the way to underneath their tier 2. Because not only do they have to clear the wave under tier 2 and let's say you've won your lane you've got a lead, they don't want to be killed by you, they don't want to be trying to push up here without knowing where you are, now they're scared to get the wave from under the tier 2 all the way to your tier 1. And also, even if they see you on the map rotating to a fight, they need to clear this wave, the next wave, and probably even three waves tops. But it's a long time they have to spend clearing waves before they're even near your tower and pressuring the map. Which during that time you can get dragon for your team, force a team fight, whatever you want to do with that time. It's up to you. But for the most part, they are really limited in their options because... If you, for example, only had the tier 1 tower uh, alive, let's say this one is still alive, then you can only really buy enough time for like 30 seconds tops to fog down this river and before you have to be back or you're just going to give them a tower for free. So I highly recommend if you're playing champions that excel in side lane to play for Herald early game and we'll go through that later. But if you play for Herald early game, then it really helps your jungler have the option to break either the top tier one or the bot tier one for the most part. He might choose to break mid, but if you're a side lane champion, it's a lot better for you to have these side lanes open so you can buy yourself more time to impact the map. And also the same pressure applies the reverse where if they've broken your tier one tower, it's a lot harder for you to pressure the game because if they were to push you under your tower, like we said before that you're doing to them, then you're really limited in your movements because if you're to leave your lane and try to help your team somewhere else they could really break this tier 2 tower and this just gives such a large amount of gold and then it opens the lane even more so they can pressure more in the future that i highly recommend not dropping this unless it's a game winning fight like fourth dragon or something or baron but for the most part you don't want to be dropping your tier 2 which means you'll be stuck under it catching waves until, unless they make a mistake now the good thing about solo queue is your lane opponent is going to make a lot of mistakes so that'll give you a window let's say they over rotate to a second ocean dragon something useless you can be backing your team i don't want to fight this and then you can use that time to push your wave all the way to his tier one tower and then if he wastes even more time you can break this tower which means now it's even both these towers are dead so if you're stronger now from the money you got from the waves and the tower depending on the matchup, you can start pushing the wave to tier 2 and now it's your turn to hard pressure the game. So for the most part, what you need to keep in mind if your tier 1 is down, is to, depending on how strong they are, if you can just fight them, just do it obviously, uh, as long as you know where the jungler is, but for the most part, let's assume they're stronger than you, you want to be catching the waves under tower, and then ideally you'd have a pink ward in this bush, so you can keep tabs of their movement, and if they over rotate, you can choose to, and your team is strong, you can choose to help fight, or if your team is weak and you're going to lose that team fight, you will hard call them to concede whatever the enemy top lane is going for. And then you have bought a lot of time, well he's bought you a lot of time to push the wave back in and either break tower or, now let's say you don't want to break the tower, you can even rotate and force a fight of your own when they answer the wave you're pushed in. You have a lot more options basically when you have someone that makes mistakes, if they play perfectly, it's very hard for you, but lucky for you in solo queue, it's very rare you'll be someone that's really good at this concept. So for the most part, you should be able to impact the game no matter what. So to quickly recap, tier 1 towers are extremely important because if you're able to break the first tier 1, you can keep them pinned under tower and that allows you a lot of time to either rotate and help your team or just keep the enemy pinned under tower and make him useless. And the same as the reverse, where if you were to make mistakes and lose your tower, 
Now they have more control of the game, but if you're more confident in how to play out that scenario, you can really see when they make a mistake by over rotating and use that uh, timer to re-control top lane and either break the tower or gain yourself a new timer to help your team in a different way. I'm next going to be covering, in my opinion, the most important concept of playing mid-game, and that is the pin and fog. Now, you might recognize this example from a recent solo queue game I played in the Aatrox Guide. However, I want to showcase it again because this mid-game is a good example of what to do when you've won your lane, or even if you haven't won your lane, you get pushed in the side lane versus your opponent, and the there's not many opportunities for you to impact the game. So if you're Aatrox or Fiora, Champs like this, where your engage is quite low, but you still win side lane, then this is a good example of when to use Pin and Fog, because in this game here, my whole team is losing lane, basically. Whole team's losing. And even though I'm at my strongest, one and a half items, one of my strongest spikes, and I really want to be forcing a fight and basically changing the game from losing to winning, in this game, they have Ash Braum. So even if I were to run bot and try to force a fight, they have all their summoners, they are very defensive, and the chance we kill them, let alone even burn their flash, is very, very low. So for the most part, even though I do want to be impacting how bot lane's going, it's not realistic. And if I were to run bot and try to force on them, that gives Camille a lot of free space where she can push wave all the way under tower and maybe even break the tower if I take too long to get back there. And more than likely, I'll have to even TP back there. So now Camille will have first base, she will have burned my TP, and she will have a timer to run onto the map and try to ult and kill someone, which is a lot easier for her champ than mine. So I'm even though I want to impact this game, I have to be realistic, and in this game, the most uh, impactful thing I can be doing is pinning and fogging, not allowing the Camille to play, and also pressuring the enemy jungler and the enemy mid. And if I want to impact bot in this game, it has to be with a TP flank. However, I don't think it works out in this game. I don't think my team... I think I asked them to place wards earlier and they were unable to, which is fine. You're not always able to get flank wards if you're losing bot. So I'll be doing the next best thing in this game, which will be pinning and fogging. Now, in this scenario here, I don't know where Kha'Zix is. So I'm pressuring Camille off the wave still because there's a good chance I can 1v2. And then I'm trying to eat his camps to deny him. Even though he's winning, I want to be denying him and forcing him to react to me, which is happening here. There's no way Camille goes on me without Kha'Zix, which is how I know he's there. And now that I've got Camille pinned under tower, I actually called to look for a Herald. And even now, denying Kha'Zix the crab and chunking him, really pressure, like chasing him back into his own jungle. If I were to have run bot here, then Camille would push all the way and they would get a free Herald. And the chance we kill Ash is almost zero. But now, in a game where my whole team is losing, and the Zed even suicides, we're getting Rift Herald. Camille has low options, because right after this Herald, I'm going to go back to pinning and fogging. And now, the game state is actually quite good, even though my whole team was losing before this point. It's really changed, not completely changed the game in our favor, but it's making the game more favorable, just from me denying Camille and Kha'Zix the opportunity to play. Now, to go into detail about what pin and fog means, let's say here, you've broken the tier 1 because you can't really do the strategy unless you're broken the tier one. And now once it's gone, you wanna be pushing the wave all the way and keeping them pinned under tower, like we talked about earlier. But now that he's pinned, the next steps are, you wanna be moving into this jungle and fully taking it over by getting a normal ward here. Blue trinket's fine, but yellow trinket there ideally, and a pink ward here. And now that you've got control of this jungle, you wanna be heading back to the next wave and catching it right here. You don't want to be catching it here, you don't want to be catching it here, you don't want to give the enemy top time to move and do anything. You catch it as far up as possible, so that they need to catch their wave as far, as quickly as possible, which gives them almost no time to leave their lane and look to really have an impact on the game. And now this next step is, once you've got the top jungle fully controlled, now you have so many options. You can rotate to dragon if you want, you can look to threaten a dive on mid, like even just a normal gank on mid, you can eat their camps off cooldown, and for the most part, this is an extremely pressuring map state because if their jungler wants his three top camps, he's going to have to come in to your vision and fight you where you're most likely a strong side lane champion. And if he's strong enough to fight you, like in the Aatrox example we showed, then you're wasting a lot of his time because he has to run to his jungle, he has to fight you off his Gromp, his Wolves, whatever camp you're holding. 
And this whole time he's doing that, you're wasting the top laner's time, his time, and your whole team could farm and look for their own plays for free, uncontested, because the jungler's wasting time not even killing you, not even pressuring you, but just blocking you from pressuring him. And say he doesn't go into your jungle, then you have even more options because you can be eating his camps off cooldown and you can also be threatening to dive mid if you see the enemy solo laner, another solo laner, the mid laner, stuck bot somewhere. Then you've got a huge opportunity if your mid laner wants to get a part of this play to dive mid 5v3. And for the most part, it's pretty hard to dive mid tier 1 tower unless you've got the mid laner pin bot and the top laner pin top. And at that point, you're already hard winning the game. But it's still something you can look for. And even if you don't dive them, the threat of you diving them will make them scared to ever try to get mid push. So even though you might not even be anywhere near mid, you might just be sitting on your pink, they're still scared of the possibility of you coming. So that's basically pin and fogging, just pressuring the map as hard as you can whilst maximizing your CS. Next, we're going to touch on threatening mid because once you start applying pinning and fogging, this is one of the plays you have available to you and it really helps for you to know the conditions to pull this off. So here I'm pinning and fogging Fiora and even though the wave's coming in and I do want to be onto it on spawn, there is dragon coming up which means I'm hovering more than I normally would and the body language of their bot lane who are now mid makes me stay an extra timer. Now it's important for you not to just follow the rules blindly and go back to top where you don't always have to dive mid, but if they are playing aggressively, you can like tell by their body language that they're about to fight or overextend. There are scenarios where it's good for you to drop your wave and threaten them and punish them if they make their mistake. Now you won't always be right. There'll be times where you think they're playing aggressive and they play like cowards, and then you drop your wave for nothing. But for the most part, I want you to be practicing looking because it's one of the most impactful parts of pressuring between the lanes is being able to punish mid if they are to ever do anything aggressive. And then from that point on, this point on the game, the game I'm showing now, now they're going to think twice before leaving their tower, right? Every time I'm fogging, they're going to be scared of me. And even though we only got one kill, I'm pretty sure the pressure I've put on the map now from showing that, hey, if you ever leave your tower, if you ever play aggressive, I'm going to punish you. And then continuing to pin and fog really changes the way that not just my top lane is playing, but the bot lane as well. The next topic is neutral objective timers. Now this concept and the last one, pinning and fogging, actually have a ton of synergy. And if you're able to apply both of them, your impact in the game, not just in side lane, but in the overall game state itself will be really high. Now, for the most part, you want to be basing between 30 and 90 seconds before a neutral objective. And the reason the time is so so much variance in the time is because on some champions, you really need to be there early. So let's say you're playing cannon. It's good to base around 60, 70 seconds before and get to the objective before it spawns. So you actually have time to sweep and find yourself a clear avenue to enter the fight. Because cannon, quite bad at front to back, but if you're able to get on the team's backline, your champ's really powerful. But if you were to enter the dragon late, then they're starting the dragon in front of you. You actually don't have time to get around behind them, and they also have a lot of vision. They're going to see you the whole time, and they have a lot more choices of someone stopping you. That your impact in the fight will be a lot lower than if you were there early, you swept a nice flank, and if they were to start the dragon, you're already in position ready to pull the trigger. Now, in this game, this example I've got here, I played Olaf and I based around a minute before the dragon and I based that early even though my champion's not that good at flanking because I wanted to push the wave all the way to bot tower because for the most part versus, uh, for dragon fights you want to have either the mid wave or the bot wave and ideally if you have both you have a lot of control but if you're to give them bot push and mid push it's very hard to fight the dragon because you have no real control of the map you can't see where they're coming from. So in this game, I push bot all the way, and because of that, I notice Zeraf has to catch the wave. Now, as soon as I see this, I know Zeraf, he's a control mage, he has to join his team, so I hide in a position where I think, feel like he's going to be coming from, and I'm actually able to cheese and kill him. Now, at this point in the game, I'm 0-2, the Zeraf's quite strong. I was able to, I wouldn't say carry this fight, but basically make sure it's a winning fight just from basing early, getting the wave all the way under tower and punishing his mistake. And even if he didn't show there, we would have full control of the map. They'd be losing CS to tower and I'd still have avenues to attack them through their jungle. 
And to quickly go through another example of a time this can be really impactful is here, where even though I could keep pushing and pressuring as I'm full HP, I base around 30 seconds before Baron. Now granted it should be a little earlier, I should have based around 40, but uh, I'll slow down due to killing my lane and getting the wave in, so it's fine. And the main point is I'm here as it spawns or before it spawns, and I'm fully controlling the area with my team. Now, the reason it's important in this game is because I have Ignite, not TP, so I don't, and I'm really strong. So if I'm not here on time, there's a chance I can get stuck bot by someone pushing it all the way. But if I'm here earlier or on time, we can get a lot of pinks in their jungle, fully control, and start the Baron in their face on spawn. Whereas if I was late, the time it would take me to come here and get full control is time the enemy top or mid could push bot all the way and make me respond as an Ignite Renekton. Now, if I was to come here late and just start the objective anyway with no control, it becomes more of a flip where they could actually win the fight or steal the Baron and it's just a, not really in our favor. So for the most part, you want to be basing 30 to around 90 at maximum, but not, I wouldn't go any more than 90, but around 30 to 60 is the sweet spot before an objective. Getting there early and setting up before you take a fight so that there's a higher chance it's in your favor. Up next, we're going to cover staying up in tempo. And what that means specifically is being on the map before your opponent pressuring. So to give an example to help you visualize it, let's say you and your lane opponent both need a base and buy an item. You push a wave under his tower and you recall instantly, whereas he, he has to clear that wave under his tower. And then let's say he eats Krugs to finish off his item. He spent 30 seconds to a minute farming the wave after you and clearing that camp. With that whole time you're based, you're running back to lane, you're clearing the next wave. So now he, no matter what, he either has to run to his team and give you the tower, or let you bash the tower a bit, or he has to go back and catch the wave that you've already pushed. And this whole time he's walking back to lane and catching the wave after you, you're pressuring the map in some way. You could start a dragon fight, a fight on mid, you have a lot of options, all because you base before him and you're up in tempo, which gives you the driver's seat to impact the game. So now that you know what staying up in tempo is, we'll go over how to stay up in tempo. And the ways you do that are basing before your opponent, we've covered that, and then while fogging between the lanes, making sure you don't over rotate. So an example of over rotating would be, let's say your team's wanting to do dragon and you run all the way from top to tower, all the way to dragon, and you find out your team was going to get it without you. Whereas if you're watching the whole time, there's probably some signs that the enemy weren't going to contest at all, and you didn't need to rotate all the way there. And now they have rotated, your lane opponent is pushing the wave all the way to your tower, and then basing, getting the first recall, and then you have to go back, catch your wave, base after him, and now he's up in tempo, and he can have some sort of impact on the game. And if that situation were to happen, sometimes it is better to stay up in tempo and just base at the dragon and let your minions die to tower so that you've based before your opponent. But if you're in a game where you're winning and you're just dominating your opponent, you don't want to be letting him farm for free and get a minion advantage over you. You want to be making him unable to play the game, stuck under his tower and pressuring. And the only reason you're going to alleviate pressure is to gain a big advantage, like a team fight or something more than just a dragon, right? Breaking a tower, breaking a couple towers with a herald charge. But just over rotating for a free dragon that your team's going to get without you and giving pressure for that is just quite bad. The next bullet point, avoid panic TPing to a fight. Now the only reason I have this in there is because I see it very often and it's something I used to do myself where you see someone engage on let's say your AD carry mid and you instantly TP but they're just going to get completely one shot and the enemy's going to walk it out anyway so it's just a wasted fight and now your well it's not even a fight at all your opponent your teammates just died for free and you're not going to gain anything from it but now you've lost tp your lane opponent can push and he might even get the base before you while you're walking back to your lane trying to catch the lost minions so the only reason i have it in here is because it's a common occurrence and even though it might be obvious just think about that as you're about to push the tp button isn't a fight actually going to break out will i change the outcome of it and if it just looks like it's going to be a quick fight like someone gets one shot and it ends then be more disciplined and hold your tp now this next one is actually a skill I worked on a lot this year, and that is basing as soon as the fight is done. Now, what I mean by that is, let's say you've won a team fight, and for the most part, if you're doing a team fight, you're going to be low, right? You're going to have used all your mana or be chunked in some way. You will need to base, and a lot of people, they hang around just hoping the fight, the enemies into again, like you get more kills from it, because obviously killing people in a team fight gives you dopamine, and you just want to keep, keep it rolling. 
But if they are obviously disengaging and there's no chance of a fight, the faster you base, the better. Because if you are to stay an extra 30 seconds chasing them or farming a camp, when people die, especially now, you get home guards so early, they're going to come back onto the map pressuring it. They might even gain tempo from it. Whereas as soon as you kill, let's say you kill two people, get your double kill, and the fight's done, if you're at a base instantly, run back onto the map, push the wave under tower, now when they're coming out of base with their home guards, they just have to go and catch a wave. And while they're catching it, you're still going to be pressuring the map. So I definitely recommend working on the skill, even if you don't fully understand the tempo concept this is a skill you can develop and it will be really impactful in your games and the last one and definitely the most obvious is avoid dying and getting chunked for no reason now of course this is bad right even if you're not playing for tempo dying or getting chunked for no reason has no benefit but this is still something i see a lot of players do they try to i don't know poke the opponent and get chunked in themselves when if they're able to stay full hp and continue pressuring the map then they're always ready for when a fight breaks out or a play. But just trading HP and just being mindless about it can often make you need to base and ruin your tempo. So as long as it's in your mind, you want to be staying full HP so that you can not necessarily full, but enough HP to impact the map, then you avoid getting chunked or dying needlessly more often. Now we know what it is and how to do it, we will cover the benefits. Now, the main benefit is we've gone over this a lot in this video, but your lane opponent has very little opportunities to impact the game because you're always up in tempo, which means you're always pressuring the map before them, which means for the most part, they are responding to you. Now, the second puts the most amount of pressure on the enemy team. Now, we covered this a lot in pinning and fogging, where if you're up tempo and pinning and fogging, then they're scared mid, the jungle's scared to enter his jungle, and your enemy top stuck. So it's the most impactful. You can impact basically more than half of the map and it's definitely the most pressuring play then if you're down tempo and just catching waves under your tail next point lowers the chance of team dying without you there now in the example we just talked about where if you're down tempo and catching a wave under your tower that means your enemy top has a window to move which means there's more enemies on the map trying to make a play which means there's a higher chance of your team dying or having a fight without you but if you're up tempo and you're the one moving between the lanes while your opponent is stuck then there's a high chance of the enemy team dying without their top laner there. And the final point, which is pretty underrated, is practicing this will increase your map awareness. Now, if you're aware of tempo and trying to apply this concept in the mid game, you'll be thinking about your lane opponent when he needs to base, if he's chunked, if he has a lot of money, and if you need a base as well, you'll be thinking about basing before him and then getting the wave out. And you'll be thinking about how to use this wave to impact the map. Because as you're walking back to lane, you'll be thinking to yourself, all right, I'm up tempo. I'm going to get the wave in before him while he's answering it. What do I want to do? Which means you'll be looking mid, you'll be looking dragon. You'll be really analyzing your options because you're thinking about being up in tempo and how to pressure the map with this advantage that you've got. Up next, we're going to cover side laning versus team fighting champs. And you're probably thinking that a lot of these concepts are only applicable to strong side laning champions. But that's not true at all. Of course, the most aggressive options are, but there are a lot of takeaways you can apply to your team fighting champions. So let's say you're playing Malphite or Orn, there are still ways you can use this information to impact the game. And we'll go through that now. So now we'll go through what to do if you're on the other side of it. And in this situation, let's say you're playing Orn versus Fiora. And the Fiora's jungler has taken Herald and blown up your tower. Now, Fiora should push this wave un under your tower and she should base because she just got a large influx of money from the tower. And if she's not going to base now, she will base eventually to spend that money. And when she bases, you want to base if you have to, but you want to head straight into your jungle and ward it up with pinks and your yellow. Now that you've got full control of your jungle, if the Fiora is not trash, if she doesn't just go on Aram, she'll come back to lane, try to push you onto tower, and then she'll run into your jungle. But now you've got full control of your jungle and your team can see what she's doing and play accordingly. If she's trying to eat wolves or gromp, your jungler might look to gank her like they did to me in the Aatrox game. Or if your jungler doesn't want to help you, which might happen, then at least you see what she's doing and you can make, decide your next move accordingly. She might, after gromp, she might run mid and try to gank them for some reason because it's solo queue, there's a lot of mistakes. And then as soon as you see her leave and not pin you, then you use that timer to push your way back to even. Because you're the tank champion now, not a split pusher, you don't want to be bashing this tower forever. You just want to reset wave to even and run upriver, or like wherever you want to run. You want to group with your team and look to engage on them. 
You can either engage on them a dragon or a mid if they're pushing. You just want to help your team in some way. That's why you're picking Ord or Malphite. You want to be a frontline and a hard engage for your team, right? And Fiora wants to break stuff in the side, but if you're not leaving at bad times, she can't really break towers in front of you until she's like three, four items. So for the most part, you just want to have full control of your jungle, see what she does and punish accordingly. Then in the very rare situation where the enemy Fiora is playing well, permit pinning and fogging, not allowing you to roam, eventually she will need to base. She will either run out of mana from clearing the waves, she'll get too much money that she needs to spend, she will base eventually. And on that timer, you can clear your wave, base as well, and run straight mid and look to engage on them. Now, if they respect your timer, which they should, then your team will fully control top river and now Fiora is going to really struggle to push because you've helped mid and now your team has helped you by clearing the vision on her side of the map which means if she tries to push she's very scared of getting ganked and dying and the more time she's respecting the more time you can look to engage and really do what your team wants to do secure neutrals force team fights and be a frontline for your team next topic will be controlling the game and what i mean by this is making shot calls for your team when the situation calls for it and you don't need to shock call every little thing that's going to be it's not sustainable there are a few shock calls that are extremely important in solo queue that you need to master and anything else that you do is good but not necessary and the two main ones are when to give something and when to take something basic to simplify it and i've got an example here where we got baron we came onto the map everyone's feeling strong everyone wants to fight but my Katarina makes a big mistake, as solo queue players do, and gets caught. So now, my team still wants to fight Dragon. However, as I'm wanting to control the game, I spam ping, no, don't do Dragon. I don't need to type anything. You just back ping what you don't want to do, and you assist ping what you do want to do. So I choose, well, I call, give this Dragon, I don't want to fight 4v5 without Baron. Just come and fully control their top jungle, and then use our Baron to pressure mid and top. And then after they do dragon, they're going to have to base, they're going to have to deal with two Baron waves. And during, by that time's done, Fiora is going to be, uh, Katarina is going to be back on map, ready to pressure with us. So because my team listened and they rotated here, me killing this guy is just extra, doesn't matter. But the main point is, my team did not take a fight at dragon and all get aced, or Sejirani didn't try to steal and die for no reason. They listened to the call, and they, they gave the objective, and they came to the objective I wanted them to. Now... In saying that, they will not always listen to you. There are a lot of situations where I've made a pretty good call and my team's chosen not to listen and it's gone poorly. And it might be tempting to get frustrated, but you really need to accept that it's a solo queue environment where everyone is doing what they think's best. And if they don't listen to you, that's just reality and start planning the next step. But for the most part, I found if you're playing well and you're fed, people will listen to you. And then if you're able to make good calls, you'll win a lot more games. We're going to wrap it up with this final takeaway and that all of these concepts are not going to be applicable every game. The main point of it is to grow your knowledge to give you the tools to figure out what kind of game you're in, what kind of game state, and how you can highly impact the game, what your most impactful play is. Because there could be some games where there's 80 to 90 kills and there's just perma team fighting. And in that case, you might not even have time to pin and fog or use the side lane to create pressure because the most pressuring thing will be to just be at this fight and group with your team as fast as possible. Or there'll be another game where being a dragon early as say cannon might not actually be the best play because it means their Fiora is just gonna hard push and let's say their Fiora is their strongest member. It might actually be better to stay in this lane and make the dragon fight a 4v4 for your team. So there are variables to all of these concepts, but the main point of this video is to expand your knowledge to the point where you have different tools for different uh, situations in the game. And in the end, it should lead to you being extremely impactful in your games if you're able to use these concepts. We're going to wrap it up there. And as usual, let me know in the comments what you'd like to see next, what concept, what champion, anything you'd like to know about the game as a top laner. And yeah, we'll leave it there and I'll catch you next time.